If you're actually curious about this, do have some enterprise in mind. If you Google for Amazon Calculator or Amazon Web Services Calculator, you can plug in some、uh, placeholder numbers like I expect 1,000 hits, I need this much RAM, this many CPU cycles, and they'll estimate what your bill might be. All right, so let's now start solving the problem, irrespective of who's hosting our servers, of scaling in general. So, there's this notion of load balancing, which thus far in this class certainly we haven't had to deal with. Back in our web programming days, you had one appliance and thus one server, and you had as many clients as you had browser windows open. But this is not necessarily the most scalable approach because as soon as you start having hundreds or thousands of users visiting your site, even per second, one web server might not actually be able to handle them all.、Um, how many hits per second can a typical web server handle from users? Any guesses? Just order of magnitude? The answer definitely depends, but how many zeros are we talking here? Any guesses? Thousands. Thousands. Okay, so thousands is <laughs> pretty encompassing. So thousands is a good answer. So you can expect a typical server that has maybe four cores or eight cores, maybe a couple of gigs of RAM, and doesn't really matter how much disk space, you can assume that it can handle maybe 3,000 hits per second, 2,000, 5,000. Any more than that, then you probably need some slightly fancier hardware. And I say it depends because it, of course, depends what your code's doing. If you have lots and lots of nested loops and things that consume cycles, obviously it will scale less well than that. But that's a reasonable starting point. A couple thousand or a few thousand hits per second. So, suppose you get more popular than this and you actually have 5,000 hits per second, or you have just a few, couple thousand hits per second, but your code is actually pretty involved. It's doing a lot of analytics, it's storing a lot of data, so each individual server can only maybe handle 500 hits per second. What do you actually do? Suppose you exhausted the resources of cloud.cs50.net or your own appliance. How do you start to scale up so as to handle? Multi- even more users. Load balancing is going to be the answer. But how? What does this mean, Zach? Add more machines to the problem and then、okay. send users to whichever machine is the most good. Okay, good. So if this is a web based site and we have a web server already, either in the form of the appliance or assume that, the appli- assume that your web server is now hosted on some physical box or some virtual private server, well, if you've got twice as many users, just double the number of web servers that you have. So your picture, you might have multiple clients as depicted up here at the top. You have, might have N servers down at the bottom. So you need some way, some device, some piece of software, generically called a load balancer, to figure out what client should go to which of these servers. Now, how do you go about doing that? How could we implement this current, this black box, this rectangle of the load balancer? And let's just assume for simplicity HTTP for now. So, user at home sits down at client computer, types in yourwebsite.com, hits enter. What happens? How does that request make it to server one, two, or dot, 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 n? Yeah. Okay, good. So we could keep track of how busy each server is, and how do you want to measure, measure busyness? How many, how many requests is processing at the same time? Okay, so let's keep track of how many requests each of these servers on the bottom of the picture is getting per unit of time, and whoever has the fewest at this instant will receive the next incoming request. So that seems nice and logical.、Um, takes into account load, so you would think that you would have pretty uniform distribution, not of numbers of users, but of load across servers. So let's now ask the more technical question how do you go about implementing that? Yeah, Kevin. Yeah, so absolutely. So, if we didn't want to keep track of a specific number of connections, which might not reflect how much work each connection involves on the server, we could instead look at thing, the, the more generic load. So, how many CPU, what percentage of the CPU is actually being consumed right now? How much RAM is actually in use、uh, among those several servers? And then just pick the lowest. That could work as well. So, how does the lo- suppose that we now have software that someone else wrote that can answer questions of the form, who is the least busy? Or to whom should I send this request? Now, let's ask the technical question of how do you route the request from, server, from client to server? What does this load balancer actually do? And again, assume the internet, so assume IP, TCP, UDP, whatever you're familiar with. 
How do you implement this? Yeah. Are you notify the client that the, the IP address of the server he needs to connect with? OK, good. So if the, this is all over the internet. We're using TCP IP. And the way that machines talk with TCP IP is to address their requests to specific uh, destination IP addresses. Why don't we just tell the client directly the IP address of whichever server is currently the least busy? So we need to involve the DNS system for this, right? domain name system, so that when a client a uh, user at a client types in yourwebsite.com. Recall that in the uh, story uh, that, you might have, uh, that we told in 50, that you might have heard in one, CS143, there's a DNS server somewhere at the ISP, at the university, whoever's closest to the client that answers queries of the form, what is the IP address of your company? Com. So that DNS server could somehow be part of this picture and simply answer that question based on the current load. So that's actually nice. Um, works well in that it does indeed tell the client to then contact that specific IP address. So now let's find fault with this design. Yeah. Well, computers cache DNS addresses as well as Harvard is pretty bad about refreshing DNS. Exactly. So caching, which generally is a good thing in that it can improve performance, it's also a bad thing in that information gets stale. And in this case, the information that might get stale is who is the least busy at this moment in time. And if you have browsers like Chrome and IE caching DNS lookups, which they do, and you have Windows and Mac OS and Linux caching DNS lookups, which they also do, and you have ISPs, DNS servers caching lookups as they do, even if it's for some number of seconds or minutes, the load on these servers is presumably going to be fluctuating quite a bit. And yet, if we're answering queries based on this moment in time, and those answers are then reused for some number of seconds or minutes, we might accidentally end up overwhelming server one or server two. And now we might actually have some users experiencing downtime or significant delays, even if server n is completely idle and has resources to spare. So DNS works. It's nice and simple. And in fact, we can do it even more simply with DNS. With DNS, we don't really even need a load balancer per se. We could just have the DNS servers use something called round robin, which in computing generally means not using any kind of intelligence to decide what answer to return, but just responding in round robin order. The first time I, the DNS server, am asked, what's the IP address of, the, of your company.com, I say 1. And then the next time I'm asked, I say 2. And the next time, 3. Three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So round robin is actually quite nice and appealing because of its simplicity, but what does it suffer from as well? Sorry? Stale information. Stale, well, stale, not so much stale because it's just, it's not you taking any information to account. So, so what's really the downside? I was thinking, like, what if one of the machines goes down and it has a problem? Okay, good. So if a server goes down and you're still spitting out one IP address, one nth of your users might reach dead ends. Uh, what else? You could have like asymmetric load per user. So like that sort of connection can be using a lot of resources. So by the time it gets back, you actually don't want to go back to server one. You want to skip over to server two. Exactly. So if, one, if the first user that visits your website is really resource hungry and starts uploading lots of photos, whereas users two and three just check their wall real fast and then log off, well, you might be sending accidentally a disproportionate amount of load, not number of connections, to the same server. So it doesn't, necess it doesn't take into account load. But it's super easy, and you don't need to buy or configure special software to do it. You can do it entirely with your uh, ISP's DNS setting. So upsides, downsides. So this load balancer then, um, we want requests to come in. They, how else could we do this then? If DNS doesn't seem to be solving this for us very reliably. Yeah, Dan. Yeah, so we could actually have the load balancer perform a routing function whereby the requests just come into the load balancer. Everywhere on the internet, the load balancer itself represents the IP address of this website, yourcompany.com. And when the request comes in, it's the load balancer who's closest to servers 1 through n that decides, oh, server 3 is now the quietest. Let me route this request to him. And then using lower level TCP mechanisms or Ethernet mechanisms can send that data from the load balancer directly to the server. The server will then reply to 
the load balancer most likely, and then the load balancer in turn will respond to the client. So not unlike NAT, network address translation that your home routers might very well be using. And you can even be fancier than that. The load balancer technically could route the request to server three, but change the return address to actually be that of the original to do direct return, as it's called, so that you do have to have this funnel of information all coming in. But if the data you're spitting out is large chunks of data, like video files, you don't need to pass all of those video files back through the load balancer or they can go potentially directly back to the user. Yeah, Meryl. Is the load balancer synchronizing like, databases or other resources stored on all these individual servers? Or is there, is there some way that it's intelligently saying, OK, you know, the client will let you do something on server two, so we need to set it to server two. But how do you, how do you aggregate databases and uh, resources across them with this system? Perfect segue. So short answer is no. The load balancer doesn't do any of that. And for those following along on camera, um, what, does the data, what does the load balancer not do? It doesn't take into account any kind of shared state that must be shared across these several servers. By shared state, we might mean sessions. So recall from PHP, there's the notion of the session superglobal in which you can store uh, per, uh, stateful information, even though HTTP itself is stateless. Uh, you might have actual records in a database that need to persist across servers because, again, in the round robin form, if I visit the website now, I might end up on server one. If I hit reload or click on some link, I might end up on server two or three just by nature of my DNS lookup expiring, my getting a new IP address back. Or the load balancer itself might be dispatching me here at first, then here based on changing load. But the problem is if these web servers aren't all identical, I could get very different views of the world based on chance based on which server I end up at. And in fact, Facebook has not always gotten this right. Probably all of you at some point have logged in and you see some posts on your news feed. And then if you hit reload, you kind of see different ones, even though they're not newer per se. You just didn't see them before. Hit reload again, and you might see another view of the news feed. And this happens from time to time. And as best I can tell, it's actually just a bug, or it's something related to caching, whereby in each request, you're getting an answer from a different cache, which is probably not the intended effect, um, but um, you can infer from these symptoms what might be going on. So how do we solve this? And ideally, we minimally want sticky sessions, which means that when you've created a session, and sessions generally remember that you have logged in or who has logged in, you'd like this information to be invariant across which all of the servers to which you might be routed. So let's take a step back to PHP at least, but the same idea exists in Java and JSPs and Python and uh, Ruby and web context. How, do, how are sessions implemented, say, in PHP, since that's what we used? The HTTP headers. Yeah, so in the HTTP headers is what? Sorry? In the HTTP headers is what? Is the user's login information, and then you can save additional session data in the database. Okay, good. So, and it's not quite the user's login information per se. When I do go to uh, cs164.net and I log in, and the website thereafter remembers that I've logged in. It's not going to be my username and definitely not my password that's transmitted again and again to remind the server that I've logged in. But what is passed in those headers? A cookie. A cookie. So some fairly large pseudo random value that was planted on my br in my browser in RAM or on disk by the server, and that server has a s another copy of that number, probably in a database or frankly in a lot of servers just in slash temp in a file called 1234.txt or some uh, equivalent of that. And then inside of that file or inside of that database is the stuff that I want to be remembered about me, what my username is, what my password is, or at least an encryption thereof, what my phone number, email address, and all of that information is. So that is to say, once you log into a website, your hand, so to speak, gets stamped. And you, the browser, according to HTTP, is just supposed to remind the server with every HTTP request, I've been here before, I've been here before. And that number informs the server that I've been here before. So there's an obvious security threat here, more on that in a couple of weeks, and that if someone looks at or sniffs wirelessly your hand stamp, they can pretend to be you. And you've probably seen or heard of this. Uh, Fire Sheep is the fun story to tell in that context, or the software to play with. Um, but in more um, applicable terms here, this cookie is problematic. Because where is this cookie information stored, typically? database or file system. If it's stored in the file system, which is the default for PHP, sessions are literally stored in slash temp or in slash var, slash lib, slash PHP, slash session, or something like that. Well, what's the implication? Well, when I log in and I happen to be on server one, I'm authenticated on server one. But as soon as I go to server two, my browser is still going to present the hand stamp, the big cookie value. But what is server two going to do with it? 
it's nothing, right? It's going to be confused. It's just not going to recognize that number. Or worst case, it's going to be a number that was given to someone else, but probabilistically that's not going to happen. But worst, uh, in uh, most likely case, he just doesn't have any session state for me. So what happens to me as the user? I'm prompted to log in again. So I log in again. Another cookie is planted on my computer. Then I get redirected back to the home page. This time the load balancer sends me to server three. What happens? I'm prompted to log in again, right? So this just does not work very well. So how do we solve this? Storing cookies on disk seems to be bad. 